welcome back to Functional Analysis. And as always, many, many thanks to all the nice people that support the channel and me on Steady or PayPal. In today's part 23, we will continue our journey with dual spaces and talk about some important examples. Please recall, for a norm space X, we defined the dual space X prime as the Banner space of the continuous linear functionals. So in X prime, we have all the bounded operators from X to F. As promised, this video is about examples, so I choose X to be the LP space. And as always, I want P to be between 1 and infinity. So for this LP space, the dual space looks indeed very nice. Namely, we can say X prime looks more or less the same as the LP prime space. And this P prime there is just a number, indeed it's the Hölder conjugate of P. More concretely, this means that 1 over p plus 1 over p prime is exactly 1. Okay, I hope you're not confused by all the dashes here. Here we have the prime for the number p, and here we have the prime for the space x. However, of course you see, the notation fits together in some way. So, one symbol remains to explain, we do not have an equality sign here. But we are very close to that, because this symbol says that there is an isomorphism between the two spaces. And for Banner spaces we learned, we better call it an isometric isomorphism. Now this means that we can identify each linear map here with an element in LP prime. And please don't forget, isometric means that the norm stays the same. Okay, let's see how we can define such an isomorphism, maybe from the right hand side to the left hand side. So we take a sequence from LP prime and send it to a linear operator with domain LP. For this, let's call the sequence from LP prime just X, and then TX is a linear operator on LP, so we can put in a sequence from LP, which we call Y. Okay, now comes the definition, and keep in mind, what comes out here has to be a number in F. So we have the infinite sum, the series, and we put in XK times YK. This works, as we will see soon, mainly because we have our Hilda inequality. If you don't like this definition because we put in two sequences, x and y, you can also read this as an inner product in L2. So we send x to the inner product, where the second component is open, because this is the position for y, and in the first component we have x with a complex conjugation. This is something you may have noticed immediately, this definition is just the inner product in L2. Only the complex conjugation is missing here. And therefore we have to add it here. I already told you, the idea for the definition comes from the Hilda inequality, but still we have to check that everything works here. Ok, I want to write down five properties we need to show. The first thing should always be that the definition we wrote down actually makes sense. Or in other words, the map is well defined. Then in the next step we check that the map is linear and also that it is continuous or bounded. Now because we want an isomorphism, we really need that the map is bijective. So I split that up, we first show that T is subjective. And then in part 5 we show that the norm stays the same for all x. This equation we just call isometric and please note the injectivity is immediately given by this property. Therefore, together with 4, we know there is an inverse map that is also linear and bounded. Ok, then let's start the proof with part 1. As I told you before, the well-definedness follows from Hilda's inequality. You see this if we rewrite the map in this sense, where we apply the triangle inequality for the absolute value and also use the continuity for the absolute value. I changed the order of y and x here, because then it fits with our Hilda inequality. You see our x comes from LP prime, but y comes from LP. Now here we can apply the Hilda inequality as we learned it for Fn, and then after the limit we have the p norm of y and the p prime norm of x. Both norms are finite, therefore after applying t we get out a finite number as we wanted. Now the thing missing for the well-definedness is, after applying t to vector x, we want to lie in this space. So tx should be a bounded linear functional. 
the linearity you immediately see maybe here or here and the boundedness we have with this inequality as well. Now we put all this together and we have T is a well-defined map. The next step is then that T is a linear map. This is so simple that I don't have to write down anything. I just say, you know the properties of the inner product. So let's tick the linearity and go to the boundedness. Of course, this part is almost done with Hölder's inequality from before, but still, let's write it down. The norm of Tx is the norm in Lpn prime, which means the operator norm. By definition, this is just the supremum of this set where we put in all vectors y with norm 1. Using what we have done before with Hölder's inequality, we know this is less or equal than the two norms multiplied. In other words, the whole operator norm is less or equal than the norm of x. Now to get the operator norm of t itself, we have to divide by the norm of x on both sides. Then we take the supremum and get that the operator norm of t is less or equal than 1. Hence we have a bounded operator, we can tick part 3 as well. Okay, then let's go to the actual hard part, showing that t is subjective. As a reminder, I've put the operator t here in a box, and now subjectivity means we hit all the linear functionals here on the right hand side. Therefore, let's take an arbitrary one and call it y prime. And now I want to use the linearity and conclude that I know what y prime is when I know what it does with the unit vectors e k. Now the vector e k is given by the sequence that only has zeros everywhere with the exception at the kth position there is a 1. Now by applying y prime to all the ek's we get a whole sequence of outcomes. And let's call the members just xk. Hence we get a whole sequence which we call x. We do this because we think this is a good candidate to be the pre-image of y prime under t. Therefore this is the question we have to answer. Is x really in lp prime and does it map to y prime? Now this is the part of the proof which is not so easy to see, therefore we have to try calculating a little bit. Ok, maybe let's start with our limit first, just a finite sum. So let's put in xk to the power p prime, because this should be finite when we send n to infinity. In the next step, the idea would be to bring y prime into the game, but then the absolute value and the power is blocking us to use the linearity of y prime. Hence the best thing we can have here would be just xk. But then we have to define a new variable, let's call it tk, which brings us back to the original absolute value and the power. Therefore the definition is very simple, we just have the power and divide by xk. But then this definition can only hold if xk is non-zero. But in the case that xk is zero, we can just put tk to zero. Of course this is just a simple trick, but it will help us simplifying the whole term. So we have tk times xk, but we can also write y prime e k. And at this point we can use the linearity of y prime and pull in the scalars and the whole sum. Now by having this and knowing that everything here is positive we can use the common estimate we have with the operator norm of y prime. More concretely everything is less or equal than the operator norm of y prime times the norm of the vector inside. So we have the lp norm here or just the p norm of this sequence. However, by the definition of the e case, we know this sequence is just t1, t2, until we reach tn. Therefore, calculating the p norm there is not so hard, we can immediately write it down. It's just the sum from k equals 1 to n of tk to the power p. And then the pth root, as always. And now comes the step where we want to get rid of tk again. By ignoring all the zeros, we know by the definition of tk that we have the power p prime and xk in the denominator, but now also with the absolute value. And of course now everything to the power p. This means that we have here xk to the power p prime minus 1 times p. Now by using the definition of the Hölder conjugate here, we see this one is simply p prime again. Now let's put everything together and you see it looks much easier now. We still have the operator norm of y prime, but here we have the same sum as on the left hand side just to the power 1 over p. Therefore, and maybe you recognize the trick, we can just divide by this term here 
and use the definition of the Hölder conjugate again, because then we get just the p prime norm on the left hand side. And it will be the p prime norm of the vector x if we send n to infinity. So in summary, we have that the p prime norm of x is less or equal than the operator norm of y prime. With this, you should see we have answered the first question. Our vector x lies indeed in L p prime. And the second question was: Is t x the same as y prime? Now, please recall: both objects are linear functionals defined on L p. Hence, we can just look at the difference and put in any vector y from L p. If the outcome is always zero, no matter which y we put in, then we know the functionals are the same. Now we use the fact that each y can be approximated by a linear combination from the e case from before. It's not hard to check that this always holds, so the limit is just y. Now let's use the continuity of both maps to bring the limit in front. And then the next step of course would be to use the linearity to bring the sum in front. Now you finally see where the definition of x actually came from. It was chosen in such a way that we get zero out here. So please check by the definition of tx, if you apply tx to ek, then only the number xk remains for the outcome. That's simply the case because ek has a lot of zeros in its sequence. In summary, the limit and the sum don't matter. The only thing that remains is the zero inside, so we get out zero. Namely for all y in LP, so the functionals are the same. And with this, we have the subjectivity. Hence, only part 5 remains, where we want to show that the norm of tx is the same as the norm of x. Hopefully you still remember part 3, there we have shown that the norm of tx is less or equal than the norm of x. Now for the other inequality, I want to use what we did before, so I have to choose the corresponding y prime here. This works if we know that t is injective. However, I think that's easy to see if you look at this definition again. If tx is 0, you can just put in the e case for y again, and then you see all the components of x have to be 0. Hence, for each x, there is exactly one y prime, such that we can do the whole thing from before, and we get the inequality here. However, we also know from part 4 that y prime is exactly tx. Now, by comparing the left hand side and the right hand side, you should see the inequalities we have here are actually equalities. Therefore, we have shown the isometry property. The norm of tx is the same as the norm of x. And with this, our long proof for today is finished. Of course, this was a technical proof, but there are some ideas here you can use for other problems as well. And please always remember the result here. The dual space of LP is isometric isomorphic to LP prime. Okay, I think that's good enough for today. I really hope I see you in the next video and have a nice day. Bye.